Hi, everybody. Welcome to the virtual conference Reimagining Our Worlds from Below, organized by the Society for the Study of Social Problems through its two committees that address transnational initiatives. Uh, that is the Transnational Initiatives Committee and the Ad hoc Virtual Transnational Initiatives Committee. This conference is hosted by the Orphalea Center for Global International Studies of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Thanks for being here today. Today we host the session six, Single Parents in the Global North and South, of which I am the organizer. Let me introduce myself briefly. I'm Morena Tartari. Currently, I'm a research fellow with the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, and I'm a former Mar Marie Curie. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm tired today. <laughs> I'm a former Marie Slodowska Curie Research Fellow at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Moreover, I'm one of the members of the Transnational Initiatives Committee of uh, SP. Before starting with, I would like to remind you some general rules and guidelines for the webinar. Please keep your microphones muted to avoid equities. Uh, if you're not talking. Uh, if you're experiencing bandwidth issues, uh, try turning off your camera. And this session will be recorded. If you do not agree with the recording, you should leave the virtual room now. In the chat box, you will find two items. Um, uh, both of these links are posted on the front page of the conference as well. Uh, with the first link, you can add your name to the um, uh, Triple SP Transnational Initiatives Committee guest book if you want to receive future announcements about uh, uh, the committee conferences and events. And uh, you can provide also with the second link uh, feedback about the conference if you like to do it. This live session will last one hour and a half. Uh, in this session, we host uh, six presenters. Uh, and uh, I try to um, give an overview about the presenters. Um, and we have, uh, I, I'm sorry for the pronunciation and you should correct me about the wrong pronunciation, <laughs> but in English that in your um, mother tongue language. So uh, our first presentation is from um, Farzane Ejazi, uh, Shahid University, Iran the study of single parents in Iran. Uh, the second presentation uh, is from uh, uh, Shuazri Baduri, Javadpur University, India, interpreting the biased notion of gender and underlying class struggle through single mothers' lives in the, time pandem in the pandemic time. Then we have a third presentation from Jagriti Gandhupai, Manipal Acad Academy of Higher uh, Education, India, Single Parenting, Challenging tra Traditional Familiar Norms in Urban India. Then we have Simon uh, Kazi uh, from Melbourne, uh, MIT University, with the presentation Single Mothers and Resistance to Welfare to Work, uh, a Borders in Account. Then we have a presentation from Dries Van Gas and Nina Van Heikert, University of Antwerp in Belgium, Institutionalism at Work, Gender Perception of the Work-Life Conflict in Single Parenthood. And then we have uh, a last presentation from Erin Gade, University of Wisconsin-Madison from the USA, uh, The Moms of Manolia Street, How for Black and Housed Mothers Reclaim and Redefine the Right to Housing in Oakland. Erin is not present today, uh, but uh, uh, our presentation will be soon available on the uh, website of the conference. So, um, <clears throat> this live session is not a traditional session at all, with full presentation and so on, but is a session that aims to be a discussion among presenters. So, I would ask uh, um, you for giving a short presentation of your research uh, in five, 10 minutes, uh, and then we can start uh, a discussion freely. And for questions and comments, you can use uh, or the chat box or, can, or you can raise your hand and join the discussion. <laughs> so um, I think that we can start with this uh, uh, brief presentation. I would ask, uh, because I see Dries, would you start, Dries? Yeah, of course. 
Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, Lily. <laughs> just I'm, to break I'm, the ice. <laughs> I'm, I'm just uh, trying to open my PowerPoint, um, not to share, but uh, to have my own structure to talk a little bit about my research. Um, <clears throat> so my paper uh, I would like to present here, uh, and we uploaded it uh, to YouTube as well for anyone who wants to listen to it afterwards. It's called Institutionalism at Work, uh, about the gender perception of the work-life conflict in single parents. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Antwerp, and I, I conducted my PhD research specifically on single parenthood. And within this uh, PhD research, I had a paper specifically dealing with single mothers' uh, perspectives in work-life conflict. Um, um yeah after their divorce uh in which we saw that there was like um the conflict was actually a role conflict between either the uh, aspirations uh mothers had towards their uh, in, uh social role as a mother and, and things they wanted to accomplish as being um a mother um that were uh uh, should I say that, that, would, uh, that they couldn't attain uh, due to their constraints of work, and they either either needed to uh, negotiate with the, within themselves whether they had to adjust their, um, which we call the motherhood ideology, what they want to, what they aspire to be as being a parent, or uh, they need uh, to look for more flexible uh, work arrangements, um, or uh, working less, which is actually financially. And less stable, and it's this stress between, um, on the one hand, trying to uh, financially take care of uh, the family, and on the other hand, um, yeah, fulfill your social role or your aspirations as being a parent. Um, that we call this like the the, the, the role strain problem of work life conflict. And um, in Belgium, uh, the the divorce system and the the, the, the judicial system. Um, it's actually a system in which uh, nowadays shared custody is um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the norm or trend. It's, it's what uh, divorce lawyers uh, speak out when, when people divorce, which also means that a lot of fathers actually are in similar situations because they uh, are part-time single parents. And in the next paper uh, I wrote uh, in the last year, uh, I focus specifically on, on fathers. And what was um, very interesting is that the um, work life conflict of single fathers and the work life conflict of single mothers, while they were both um, role conflicts and social role conflicts about your role as a parent and your role as an, as an employee or a worker. Um, they were also intrinsically different because there were other uh, expectations from uh, towards fathers, towards mothers, and the motherhood role is much more socially defined than the fatherhood role. Um, whereas a father that uh, tried to be uh, an, an involved father and, and make adjustments to the work context um, was actually labeled as a deviant uh, employee, uh, someone uh, swimming uh, upstream. Um, and that's kind of what, what we try to do in, in this paper is to compare these these gender discourses on which um, in in uh, in motherhood we see that uh, they struggle or or the, the struggle is, is is about the aspirations of of, of being a, a good mother um, and and this really resonates in the interviews we did with. Uh, with single mothers, because we also did qualitative research. Um, while on the other hand, we see with, with men, uh, there is there are different narratives, um, <clears throat> and these narratives go uh, way beyond um, uh, the fact that, for for example, for example, single mothers are much more financial frail than than, than single fathers uh, because there are gender inequalities there. Um, but it also shows that, um, yeah, that there needs to be done a lot of work to, uh, to, to uh, 
make this this field in combination of work and family between single fathers and single mothers more equal. Uh, and that's kind of what we we'll try to, to tackle uh, within our within our paper. So what we did is we collected 63 inter in-depth interviews with single fathers. We collected uh, 200 uh, interviews with single mothers. Uh, and uh, we used it, this in a ground theory analysis. Actually, these were two separate papers, one on fathers, one on mothers. But in this paper, we compare these perspectives and we, and we try to, to look into these, these gender discourses. And what do we what we see is actually that it's always uh, looking for a ba balance in between uh, parenthood aspirations and uh, work aspirations. Um, and while the narrative of single mothers uh, who try to look for balance is, is much more like I need to be um, easier on myself is, is maybe a bad way of calling it, but but like. Um, I, I need to lower my own aspirations of being a mother, which is actually um, a qu quite challenging. Um, while for fathers, it's like I want if I want to be an involved father, I need to change um, uh, or, or uh, combat with the, the expectations uh, my my work context has towards me, and I have to uh, adjust the working time. Um, <clears throat> And this, this, this research paper is, is very much work in progress. So we're still looking for ways how to frame this correctly, how to uh, make um, uh, yeah, uh, a right framework uh, for our results section. Of course, in theory, we also have a little bit of the, of the theory yet, um, results yet. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, because it's, it's into this, this field of gender and gender expectations, I think it's, it's, it's also quite, quite uh, difficult. What is also uh, important to, to state is that we also see differences in the narratives when there, was, uh, uh, when there are differences in gender equality or gender inequality pre-divorce. So uh, when uh, for some couples, these, these battles were already fought uh, pre-divorce because they had a quite generally equal division in work. Um, and for example, men were also already taking care when, uh, when they weren't divorced. Uh, but there are also differences in different social levels. Um, <clears throat> um, adjusting your uh, aspirations as a mother or as a father or um, at work, the expectation, uh, or sorry, struggling with the expectations at work uh, is, is, is not as easy in, in our uh, uh, social levels. I mean, some social economic groups see more autonomy to choose, um, which is very important for single parent, uh, parents to adjust their, um, their uh, work life configurations to their own needs. So I don't know if I went much over time or how much time I still have, uh, but this is in a nutshell, uh, the paper we, we wanted to present and uh, we also uploaded the presentation of course on YouTube. Thank you, Dries, thank you. I think that um, we can start with the, yes, all the short uh, presentation of the papers and then we can have a discussion so because I prepared some questions for you, <laughs> but I think that I, I've used my questions later. So I, I will leave the floor so, uh, to Fardane, if she can hear me. Yes, yes. perfect. Yes, yeah. I can thank hear you. you. Thank you. I can hear you. If you can, can start. Yeah, can thank I, you, I please. Uh, actually, uh, in Iran, uh, there is lack of statistical um, uh, data about single parent and actually uh, it's a new topic for me uh, because uh, I research about the uh, cyber uh, cyber space and education uh, as I said uh, before uh, but uh, in Iran married couples um, are less suffer from uh, discrimination than uh, single parents and uh, according to uh, some statistics uh, there is social harm to children 
uh, whose homes uh, conflicts or conflicts or um, lost uh, one of their uh, one of them uh, family uh, and uh, uh, who are single or have no family. Uh, the growth of a single parent families in Iran is so dangerous and uh, could even increase social harm in the future. Uh, families headed by women uh, are even more uh, vulnerable. Uh, the father must have authority in, in every, every family. Male authority can prevent uh, children from many uh, injuries. Uh, and the main uh, conclusion, actually, the increase in divorce and uh, uh, mortality has increased uh, the number of uh, single parents uh, families in Iran, uh, especially in the COVID, um, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and this trend is increasing day by day. And um, if there is no uh, social support for these um, uh, single parent families, the family single parents will be below the poverty line, actually. And um, men and uh, women are complementary, and the absence of uh, one of them will prevent one of the parents from playing a role uh, in the process of uh, socializing their children. Children suffer from an emotional uh, vacuum due to the absence of one parent. Uh, if the parent is the only mother and wants uh, to prepare uh, for the financial needs of the children, the woman must uh, automatically play the role of the man of the family and therefore uh, cannot care about the children's uh, training. Uh, finding a single parent in Iran has some effects on parents and children. Poverty, the situation of the economy in Iran, health, divorce, the COVID-19, uh, and uh, employment have an impact um, on single parents in Iran. And uh, based on Iranian reports uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic in uh, 2016, 7.2% 7 uh, 7, uh, in Iran were single parent families. 17% of single parent households in the country have a male head and 83% uh, of these households have a female head. It shows living for uh, women in Iran will be so difficult. And, uh, but uh, actually the general population and the housing census in Iran was initially conducted once uh, every 10 years. But uh, from 2006 onwards, it was decided to conduct uh, the census once every five years, which wasn't done last year for some reasons. One of the reasons is actually a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, according to Iranian news, at least uh, uh, 51,000 children in Iran have lost their parents due to COVID-19. And uh, these children are facing economic uh, hardship and uh, psychological problems. Based on the uh, functionalist theory, the social needs of children aren't provided in a single parent family. And uh, the divorce and the mortality have increased the number of single parent families in Iran. And uh, uh, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and aren't able to predict, uh, predict exactly uh, what happened next. However, we could uh, create uh, practical solutions. And in Iran, welfare should use a practical and effective, effective policies, uh, policies for children who lose their parents in the COVID-19 era. The government must create a solution for single parents in the COVID-19 era because they are more under economic pressure. And uh, counseling should be increased in Iran to reduce the uh, phenomenon of a divorce. I finished. I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Thank you for your short presentation. And uh, then, should work yeah, on it. yeah, I prepare some questions for you. And uh, uh, but for the moment, I will leave the floor to Yagriti. OK, so women have always been experiencing like sexual oppression, economic exploitation, every kind of like cultural subjugation, like which proves like how inequally distributed our capital is like be it societal, be it cultural, anything. Patriarchy always um, you know, has a tendency to see a woman as a vulnerable entity who always needs pitiful assistance from a man. 
so um and uh, this kind of inconsistent circulation of capital like um, turns out to be exceptionally recognizes uh, recognizable during a crisis a crisis like pandemic a crisis like any any kind of crisis so uh, pandemic like covid-19 has actually contributed to this inequality like through various factors um during this time uh, like every the nature of living of every individual became very exhaustive like so single fathers also suffered i'm not saying that they uh, had uh, like they never suffered but i am just trying to point thing point out one thing here like they never endured the same as a single mother because uh, uh, finding a job with the liability of the children is more like a valorous deed for men where a single mother have always been told that uh, in order to get rid of uh, you know the stress the mental pressure uh, all the denigrating opinions that they were receiving uh, they need to go back to their partners precisely um, taking down paid work as their destiny so uh, i have interviewed four single mothers like uh, coming from four different backgrounds like uh, the respondent uh, one of my respondent uh, is a government employee and she is um, she she is uh, economically in a very good position um, the other other two respondents of mine is not that in a good position they uh, and the, the respondent a of mine the first respondent of mine also uh, had uh, you know a very uh, i mean she belongs to a very culturally and economically sound background she she belongs to a very uh, sound background and uh, the other respondents are not from uh, they don't belong to a very culturally and economically sound background and the fourth respondent of mine uh, uh, was a domestic worker and uh, like i have seen that after inter upon interviewing all of them i have seen that uh, the during this chaotic period gendered with gender and class there are other things also matter like education job type uh, interpersonal relationships etc um, like both of the cases of lower middle class and domestic worker have shown one similarity that mental health was never a point of discussion in their life like uh, second factor the education if as we talk about education in both cases either they are a high school degree holder or completely unlettered and uh, both of them suffered financially more than the other two like the first respondent who were who belongs to a more um, sound background uh, culturally and um, economically so both of their cases show uh, one more similarity that uh, they were very much forced to go back to their partners no matter how abusive they are and uh, no matter what happened with them so my data also shows one other one more thing that upper middle class single mothers never faced the issue of hunger the government employees or huge biz- business owners were not that affected on the other hand uh, small business owners like fruit sellers day care service owner faced a downturn like their interpersonal relationships those who have a uh, supportive family and friends have a different story to share than those who were abandoned by their family so irrespective of class education job type etc single mothers have struggled and faced challenges due to pandemic and uh, um with a child to look after when a parenting became undoubtedly difficult and uh, unemployment left them with a whole void of uncertainty now uh, like mothers who didn't lose their jobs also had to juggle between work from home and child care uh, as schools and day care services were closed at that time at that point of time it was difficult and stressful for a lot of them a lot of respondents felt it would have been different if they had partners to share their mental stress like um, though women irrespective of their position are largely responsible for domestic labor and child care married women were 
less likely likely to suffer during this pandemic period so uh, during this time a lot of single mothers suffered because of the constant nagging of their parents or relatives to how their decision of separating from a husband will affect their lives and their children's lives and etc so this intersection of gender and class shows a different angle of inequality like what unlettered women had to bear and how they had to bear the brunt of it the brunt of the uh, biased notion of gender and class and on on, the, on another level than the privileged single mother um thank you thank you thank you for your presentation thank you shivazri so i think i have also some questions for you later and i think that we can leave the floor for the presentation of uh, uh, hagriti if she can hear me yes perfect thank you thank and you. welcome thank you thank you for this opportunity uh, i am very grateful and i think it's a topic that requires much attention Uh, I'm also happy that I'm presenting right after Shubhoshri because uh, you know I think I'm I'm talking more about the upper middle class and middle class and uh, this the class dynamics that she was talking about. Of course, my fieldwork happened uh, before the pandemic, so I will not be able to talk much about the pandemic because I didn't really revisit my interviews. But uh, I'll just give some background about single parenting as an upcoming family form in India. in india actually we are uh, governed like particularly the middle class and i mean to an upper middle class by the joint family system and if anybody reads the scholarship also there is a lot of family sociological literature on different kinship patterns joint family structures and much later post uh, the liberal liberalization 1991 when india uh, opened its gates to the market economy it was only then that the nuclear family system started evolving and however it is actually looked down upon and that is one of the big, biggest reasons of course is because in india elderly care continues to be supported by adult children we still haven't thought of policies to support older people who don't have children etc so which is why the whole emphasis on the family system in india is because it's kind of Uh, cyclical in that sense, you know, like parents take care of children, children take care of parents. It's because of that. So currently, nuclear uh, families are quite uh, high, and they compose the highest percentage of households in India. So, but that change in itself is viewed negatively. So, single parenting uh, in itself, now uh, recently uh, in 2019, there are 6.3 percent. Uh, single parents and 5.4 single mothers which is actually quite a higher percentage and uh, but the question to ask is that whether they still face stigma and uh, they are often blamed and women unfortunately and you know i agree with what she was also saying i'm going to uh, extend my presentation based on that women are often blamed if they are divorcees or if uh, you know their the desire to become a single parent even if they express that so uh, there's definitely a lack of scholarship on this like academic scholarship and there is uh, very few people just talk to sara lam who has touched on this topic of single parenting um ironically of course our biggest film industry bollywood has quite a few films on single mothers recently some films have been made so what i found in my data uh, primarily was that i of course covered it mostly in metropolitan cities like kolkata bangalore delhi pune it was face to face interviews went on for quite some time and uh, i also want to add i myself am a single parent in that sense because i'm in a lat living apart together relationship my husband visits me every 3 months onwards and uh, so i'm not in that sense technically a single parent my husband is very much there but of course me and my son we live all by ourselves so it was also a semi auto ethnographic study that i did and uh, i also it was easier for me to frame the questionnaire based on my own experience uh the face major biggest point i found was that uh, the biggest problem that they uh, face in india single parents is both uh, like uh, mother and father is the lack of quality support care there is still this expectation that grandparents will take care of the child but one thing that they forget is that the grandparents are also becoming old they are also growing old and it is hard for them sometimes to take care of a child 
So the institutional support that we have in the form of daycares or paid caregiving, nannies, they are not nurtured well. They are quite expensive, but they often don't provide good quality care. So uh, that, that was one of the biggest challenges. Many of them have, 90% of them actually have pets to provide companionship to the child, but the, the, the stigma is a big major problem and many of them continue to look for support because the counseling of options also that are the therapy options that are also there in India are very limited and they really, uh, often they face a lot of uh, difficult questions from the counselors and the therapists themselves. So because there is so little awareness around single parenting, generally as a new family form or a structure, and one is so easily questioned about one's parenting skills that uh, the parents themselves find it very difficult to open up, up about their challenges. And they often face questions in their children's school. They are often worried about the children's mental health because of a very traditional structural setup that India is so used to. So these these were some of the, so then you know, so the question to ask is that, is single parenting really rising? Yes, I would say yes, it is. So, but it is also important that the government takes note of this new form of parenting and provides more support and puts in place more institutional caregiving structures, et cetera, so that because most all the single parents interviewed were also working parents because finance was also a big worry for them. So financially, uh, none of them, and particularly single mothers who, uh, who became widows, a lot of them were widows who I interviewed early on. So they really couldn't stop working. And uh, it was also ironical that the mothers had to face this question that, uh, you know, doesn't the child miss the father? But the single fathers had to face a question more that are they good enough mothers, you know, like because mother in India, again, motherhood is celebrated so much. There's so much emphasis on it's not parenting. It's actually mothering that we do. So, so that was the other important finding that I had in this study that uh, father, single father, and there's actually no scholarship on single fathers. I also couldn't interview to uh, not more than 10. So the number is low, but uh, my, my final conclusion would be that much more research needs to be done on this topic. And this definitely needs scholarship attention, policy attention. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, because you, I think you raise uh, a lot of uh, topic uh, and you focus a lot, a lot of topic for uh, future research. Thank you. Thank you, Yagriti. Then I have some questions also for you. And uh, uh, now I leave the floor to, uh, what's your, exactly the presentation of your name? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it, depends, it depends what country you're um, from, yeah. but yes, in Australia, because it's Simone, um, and in Simone, France okay. and Italy, you probably say Simone or Simona. So yeah, yes. because in uh, in my own country, it would be Simone. <laughs> yes, Simona. which is a much. It sounds much nicer that way. So yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. thank you so much. Yes. I, I leave you the floor for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you um, for inviting me to be part of this session. And it's been really interesting listening to all the other presenters, and I've realised how vastly different our sort of social and political contexts are from in Australia um, versus some of the places that you're from. So I thought I should probably give you a little bit more contextual background on um, single motherhood in Australia. So um, like many Western societies, um, as there was a, a huge increase in um, single parented households uh, beginning in um, probably like the 60s and the 70s in particular, but there were um, quite a number of single parent parent households and single mothers prior to that. Um, but really, the um, you know the shift to uh, uh, so that at the moment we have 15% of our households are single parent households, and 85% of those are, are headed by single mothers. So single parent households is a big thing in Australia. It has been for some time. And single mothers have been supported by our social security system since the 1970s when a um, certain payment, um, government payment, a welfare payment was targeted to support single mothers who were not blamed for becoming single mothers. It was a reflection of um, kind of, you know, the, the shift in family formations um, and, you know, feminist influences. And so in a very liberal democracy, um, we had um, quite, quite a strong support safety net for single parent families. 
um, from that period on. So what happened since the 1970s was that there was a growing concern by governments that we had created a kind of system of welfare dependence, which meant that single parents who were supported by the welfare system were not moving from welfare into work when their children were um, old enough to go to school and be independent enough that the parents had the ability to work. So the government's um, welfare to work strategies were very much targeted at um, providing kind of motivation or incentive for single mothers to work. So basically the start of my presentation was really just at the point of um, describing a, a welfare to work um, policy initiative that had been designed to shift mothers from the single parent pension into the labour market and um, to get jobs. And so when I, in my presentation, I talked about that as a social policy reclassification event, and that had implications for the mothers, um, particularly that I interviewed, but also that I connected through through some of my advocacy and activism in the sense that, um, you know, there was this sense of kind of injustice that occurred because of this shift in social policy. Um, and it did create um, quite a lot of conflict for the mothers between their role, a role that they had assumed in terms of parenting and being responsible um, for the welfare of their children and being available to support their children um, rather than being, you know, off at a, in, a, in an office or in a work environment and not there to say to care for their children after school or to pay a lot of money to put them into after school programs or childcare, all these kind of things. And there was a lot of, um, I suppose, reflection of the idea of um, the lack of recognition for care work. And it's a feminist issue in the sense that, um, you know, being a parent is a, is a worthwhile social role, being a mother, um, is a you know it is an important support role that we play in society but it's not valued as much as actually having paid employment and so in Australia I suppose you would have you'd say that we have a conflict in perspectives between um, the forces that um, say that um, women um, and single mothers should be in the paid labour force versus um, being available to support their children as much as they would like to. And so essentially that is the kind of social policy conflict scenario we have in Australia where we have single mothers now pushing back against some of the social policy reforms so that um, you know, they're like, well, uh, coming together to collectivize to try to change social policy settings so that their mothering and especially single mothering can be um, better supported by the society we're in. I know we come from a place of incredible privilege in Australia because we do have a safety net that single mothers can um, rely on. But over time, that has been um, constantly eroded um, by government policies, which make it more and more difficult for single mothers and single fathers too. But as they say, they're a minority um, to survive within that framework um, and to provide the care that they want to, to the children. So rather than go over the detail of my um, presentation altogether, I thought I'd just kind of summarise and contextualise it a little bit more in the company that I'm in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Simon, because I found your work uh, and your article very, very interesting. Uh, um, I, I met it, your article during a literature review and I found it extremely interesting also for my, for my work. So I think that now we can start uh, our discussion. And uh, just to break the ice, uh, I have the questions for you all. And um, uh, my question is about the definition of single parents. What kind of definition we use uh, in our research? Because uh, um, um, while I'm, I read uh, different, uh, different contribution, I see that sometimes authors uh, use different definition so, and for single parenting, uh, single parents. Uh, and also I see that uh, we have a kind of uh, uh, new trends uh, in uh, single parents definition uh, in Europe. I don't know in our countries, but I see that uh, in Europe, there is a kind of new 
trend for definition of single parents. So I would, uh, uh, I would propose this kind of uh, reflections. Uh, uh, if you have reflections about uh, this topic, uh, what kind of uh, uh, definition we use in our research for single parents and what kind of uh, definition would be uh, better for our research because we see we have different uh, contributions, different perspectives also, also from uh, Jagriti before. So just uh, to start a reflection about uh, what is better, uh, the, the, the best definition or the um, suggested definition for our research, please. <laughs> I'll start if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I see there's a, a variation in language uh, internationally with, um, in Australia, we still sort of say single parent or single mother. In the UK, I see sole parent, sole um, lone parent. Um, and now I'm also seeing um, sort of one parent, one, um, one household, or one, one person household, sort of like one headed household. So like, people are trying to make a distinction between, um, you know, especially in societies where we have um, non traditional family types quite a lot um, growing, but um, between sort of single income headed families, which I think is where the most of the poverty um, tends to be concentrated because in Australia, there's a lot of divorce. There's, I think there's something like 40% of um, marriages um, uh, end in divorce um, and even more if you talk about de facto relationships in which there have been children so I think we're starting to see a little bit more of a shift towards and so in um, in Australia we have a very a shared care system so uh, so if um, a, a family um, splits up if parents split up the children can be across two households um, so the care burden um, is not as uh, heavy because you because the the child or the children will be in another household for part of the time. Um, so I think we're start, at least in um, sort of the, the West, this is probably some of the distinctions we're starting to make about single parent households and the effects of basically um, time use, stress, well-being and uh, income levels. So anyway, I'll just start that off there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. If I might add, yeah. add um, I think there are a lot of uh, nuances that, that we can make. Uh, for example, uh, if you do a study, and, and loads of the, these nuances are, are country specific or case specific, depending on why you want to research or what, what, what uh, the, the countries you're working uh, on. For example, if, if we in Belgium do research on, on single parents, there is always a question like how much custody should a single parent have to? be rated as a single parent. Uh, if we say uh, that a single parent is someone who has uh, the sole custody uh, of their children for 100% and let their ex-partner uh, or uh, the, the, the biologically different uh, uh, parent because um, <clears throat> uh, has no custody on, on them. Um, yeah, then, then we, we narrow the population very much down, but we see that there is a lot of shared custody. So um, depending on, on what we want to study, do we want to study, for example, also take into account uh, single fathers as an example. Uh, we, all, we actually need to, to be a little bit more nuanced in, in this custodial uh, arrangement. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we also see uh, just like Simone said, like there are a lot of different uh, terms that we need to use when we want to study different things. Uh, I'm currently working on a research proposal on single adult households, for example, uh, because these include single parents, of course, uh, in different ways. There are divorced parents, which is also single parents by choice. Uh, there are these um, different family forms and alternative ways of starting a family. But um, another group that's, that's uh, frail and, and prone to, to, uh, to social risks and social vulnerability is uh, our, our singles uh, or single households with one adult 
uh, in its own. And we often ignore it because they don't have care responsibilities. And, and often we do uh, our research uh, from the perspective of, of, uh, of the child and the well-being of the child. But actually, we see that uh, being a single is often uh, is, is more common and there are more life from singles as well. So we, we want to include them as well in our, in our study. Uh, and that's why we use the term, for example, single adult households in that research proposal. But if we want to, to do it more uh, child-centered or more care-centered, we need to look at, at single parent household, uh, households or children that, that grow up in households with a single adult. So I think there are a lot of, of nuances that we can make depending on our country context, depending on what we want to study, and that we need to be sensible when we choose our concepts. Thank you. Thank you, Dries. Um, are there other, other reflections from the other participants about definitions? Please start. Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, uh, the dimension of a healthy family in the parents is both together, actually we know that. But uh, in Iran, when uh, in single parents, uh, when we talk about single parent, uh, children uh, live uh, with their mother or father when they uh, lose one of them. But uh, actually, I can see uh, some children or kids uh, can live with their grandfathers or uh, grandmother, actually. But um, uh, for kids, uh, it's a great uh, live together with both of uh, 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 parents. Uh, actually, in Iran, uh, women, when the, they lose their uh, husband, uh, have, has more uh, financial uh, hardship, and they uh, suffer from, for, uh, they suffer from psychological, for example, problem. Uh, that's it. Thank you, thank you, Fadine. Uh, are, um, there are other contributions or other reflections about definition from the other participants? So in yeah, thank you. I yeah, I'll just add uh, the vision to do research on single parenting in India was that uh, there is no research on single parenting. In the sense that there are very traditional family structures like joint nuclear this lack of scholarship so and uh, particularly with regard to class like upper middle class and middle class it's now the focus is mostly on nuclear family system so that is why uh, particularly focused on single parenting to add to the scholarship because i think uh, scholars need to take note of that that is why that was the reason thank you thank you um i yes i there are, I don't know if there are other reflections, uh, Shivasri. Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, I have nothing to add, but uh, I would like to answer the question Jagrati ma'am asked in the comment box. It is very unfortunate that I haven't found a proper structure in our Indian society which works in the favor of domestic workers. Like uh, single mothers who are domestic workers, either they have to take the child with them to their workplace or they had to leave them they have to leave them you know like at home and uh, and there is another thing that uh, home has not been seen as a site of work and labor as has been the factory and the office so the gendered notion of work like has made some work appear unproductive like domestic workers are still seen as unproductive labor no matter how well they cook how meticulously they clean uh, they are just invisible like they do the all all the informal work so they are just invisible so uh, there are lack of legal protection uh, cover up social security measures like uh, and existence of well defined uh, like contours of work and rest. And the irony is that the state do take part in the like formalization of the workforce, but how that is the irony that like, domestic workers need to verify their identity in our country in India. 
they need to verify their identity and provide informations in local police stations but employers they don't need to submit such personal informations and all that they don't have to provide any kind of uh, personal information or they don't need to verify their identity so state do take interest but not in the favor of domestic workers like i like call the agencies that were present uh, the recruiting agencies they are just breaking down the the privatized mode of this domestic organization organizing of domestic work and uh, you know they are making it some kind of a, a bureaucratic process like of hiring and um, registration and, uh, you know like placement and all that but uh abuses involved at each of the states like from hiring to the placement uh, abuses is like rampant so the role of this is in uh, agencies in procuring like young girls from socially deprived communities caste regions caste um, is a you know like a very in- uh, integral part of our indian community so all the and the regions to through portions and abuse has been like consistently reported and if if it comes to a single woman with a child the intensity of harassment goes to another level so they even get exploited by their employers but no one raises a voice against it as the employer holds a superior position and uh, as far as our indian law is concerned the uh, national commission for uh, women drafted the domestic workers act in 2008 back in 2008 which and uh, some state governments did indeed take the lead in framing laws on this subject but in 2018 10 years after uh, the draft was published uh, it was said that central government was working on bringing out a national policy to protect the interest of domestic workers and the ironical part is that the thing has been pending for almost 4 years now so um, there is no proper structure which can be considered as support mechanism for domestic workers be it single mother be it single woman be it married woman anything no matter what what position they hold thank you thank you thank you shivani i i i would come back um on the on the topic of the definition of single parents and uh, i i propose um yeah i propose this kind of, refle- of reflections because uh, i see for example that in europe uh, um, there are some trends about considering for example the single parents also parents uh, um that uh, had divorce and are co-parenting because in their fractions uh, of um, of the week uh, in in which they take care of the children they are considered single parents so it's a different uh, and and in our research we had for example consideration for lone parents uh, definition of uh, not single parents but lone parents so there are um, for me from from my perspective uh, old and traditional definition of single parents and parenting uh, and new trends so i was interested in the uh, underline this kind and, and stress this kind of uh, of topic because i think that in our research we need to define very well um the definition that we use uh, because it's very important and also there is uh, underline that uh, there are nuances in uh, this kind of uh, work of the defining uh, single parents and parenting and it's it's, uh, it's very very important that we stress the, this kind of issues uh, and we frame very well um, the definition and when we uh, review it uh, and also explain our research and so thank you thank you for your contributions and i i have just the questions about uh, um, presenters from india um because i see that for um for you um in india research about single parenting is a, a, a new Uh, a new field a completely new field to consider but um, i um, from a, a person who live uh, in uh, in a western country i 
And I was wondering if uh, in, a, in a country very, very large like, like India, there are differences from regions, uh, from different religions, uh, from, uh, for example, minorities. And I was wondering, for example, how um, different religions can shape uh, the topic of uh, single parenting. Because I see, for example, in my experience, uh, um, in my personal experience and also in my experience as a researcher of single parents, uh, that uh, uh, the topic of religion and culture um, contribute a lot uh, about uh, uh, the shape of that single parents uh, and also the trajectories of that single parents uh, meet in their in their life. So I have these questions for you about uh, the idea that you have on the role of uh, uh, religions and belief about single parents. So I think that I can, I can, uh, I, uh, yes, I can pose the same questions on, uh, to the other participants because I think that uh, we can develop some reflection about the role of uh, religions and belief on uh, the topic of single parents. Yeah. If you have some okay, fair then. <laughs> thank yeah, you, so, Simon. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, Australia, like you know, many Western countries, has like uh, our origins in you know it's a Christian society. Um, so you know, um, uh, having children in wedlock was the you know the the morality that dominated our culture until probably around the nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, when there was a lot of change and um, post-war change and then um, kind of liberalization and a feminism um, to name a few of the um, changes that have um, and so we've moved far much further towards being a secular society as well so um, uh, membership of religious organizations has declined significantly and now so religion really plays a very low role in our society now so that um, Whereas, you know, a, a woman who'd been abandoned by a husband, um, you know, back in the 1920s was probably considered to have something wrong with her and blamed for the, this fact. That has just changed completely now. As I said, in the 1970s, we introduced a strong social safety net for um, single mothers, single parents, but it was mainly, um, you know, intended for single mothers because um, the government understood that this was a sort of, you know, growing form of family and that it was, and there was a need to support um, the children of those families in particular. Um, we had a, a very... Um, kind of radical government in the 1970s and one of the ministers was a minister for women and she was asked to design policies for women in Australia at that time so you know we that that explains why we've had sort of such a radical shift I suppose but you know it's a hundred hundred years on since I, I, I suppose that um Christianity has played such a strong role in our, our um, moral formation of our social policy. Not to say it's not still there in some respects, there is still some conservatism um, and not just Christian conservatism either. Now Australia is a more multicultural um, society than it had been in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for your contribution because I... Mm, I see. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, in Islam... Yeah. Okay. In Islam, uh, in, is, in yes. Islam and Shia, yeah, in Islam and Shia, uh, emphasize that uh, children, kids, uh, should uh, live with their parents, and uh, uh, families um, is an essential uh, for all the uh, uh, children and kids, and uh, that's very important. And uh, religion is an essential issue in Iran, actually. That's it. Thank you, thank you, Fatima. Thank you, because I come from a, um, a region of my own country where there is a characterized from a very Catholic conservatory um, tradition. So it's it's a very particular region. So I see that uh, um, this kind of approach uh, to family and life. Uh, um, have shaped a lot uh, uh, the stigma around uh, single parents. So I think that is very, it's very important uh, to consider this kind of uh, perspective of uh, single parenting, single parents. Uh, please, Dries. 
Yeah, I wanted to add uh, something as well. Uh, two things that you first is that um, I think for a large part the Belgian situation is kind of similar to Australia. The distance is far, uh, but that um, religion in most parts of the population doesn't play a huge role anymore. We're a highly secularized country. Uh, but I think um, that there are cultural differences in, in our country, uh, in between ethnic social groups. And I think there is a lack of research on uh, divorce and single parenthood in ethnic minorities within our country. Um, I think there is more stigma on uh, these other family forms within, within this, this ethnic minority groups. So I think there should be research on it as well to, to look into uh, which barriers they experience and and whether they're, they're uh, staying in unhealthy relationships, with, which I think is a really major benefit of being able to uh, divorce and to have this, this moral acceptance of divorce. The other thing I want to add is uh, that there is, also, uh, there is uh, an ambivalence in, in, on the one hand, uh, there is like the acceptance that we live in uh, and um, how do we say it? A serial monarchy. Um, so instead of staying with one partner, it is okay to leave a relationship when when it doesn't work out, when it, when it, when a family is dysfunctional. Uh, but on the other hand, while there is acceptance on this one, uh, there is like the structural inequality that, that's fostered through our, our policy system uh, that gives this rel relative disadvantage for single parents at all. Uh, and also, I think we need to be aware of this, and it's actually something we are, we also see in, in research. We often study the problems of single parents, but we barely study the opportunities and the resilience, and uh, how single parents are able to to function as a single parent family system on their own. And I think we need to to, to give attention to to this aspect of single parenting. Thank you, thank you, Dries, because uh, Dries comes from and um, works um, in Belgium, and I, 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 yes, I conducted a part of my previous research in Belgium, and I think that Belgium is a very small country, but is uh, characterized from different uh, groups, uh, with different, different uh, social groups, uh, um, with different conventions, beliefs, and so on, so it's very, very particular and uh, very, very worth to investigate, absolutely, because uh, you have in a small country, uh, different, uh, different social groups with varieties of, uh, uh, of conventions of beliefs, so it's very, very interesting. So thank you. And I, I, put, I was wondering if our uh, participants have um, our reflection about this topic, uh, about how religion can shape uh, the stigma around the single parenting, single parents. So I have some questions, uh, specific questions, uh, and uh, I would start, but you um, you are completely free to, to ask questions to the other colleagues, absolutely. <laughs> I start just to break the ice. And I have a, a question for Yegriti about her work because uh, um, there is uh, in particular um, an aspect of your work very, very interesting that I, I would call it autoethnography because you mentioned uh, this particular personal experience. Uh, I'm really interested in it because uh, I have uh, a similar experience uh, and uh, um, every time I, 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 I ask myself, uh, how can I use this particular and personal experience? So, so I, I, I would ask you um, how um, you use the, this kind of experience uh, from a methodological uh, point of view. So uh, as an autoethnography, um, or I don't know. Yeah, so that is right. Actually, uh, autoethnography has also been underused in India as a methodological tool. Uh, I thought about this research because I myself have been experiencing various uh, problems, challenges as a single mother. Like I often when my son is ill and I can't send him to the daycare, I have to take leave. 
and I might be teaching on that day, so it is very hard. So uh, basically, when I was drafting the questionnaire, because there is no scholarship in India per se, I uh, sort of based the questions that I was asking from that standpoint of view. And because I did ethnographic interviews and because it was it went on for like an hour or so, even more than that, I often myself was asked questions that, you know, what about my parenting? So I could connect with my uh, sample respondents much more because of my own personal experience. Like I could also share. So I could say this was a more qualitative, personalized, like it was not the very detached form of data collection method that we have been trained to do right from, you know, when we start thinking of sociology as a discipline. So that that is where I blended autoethnography. Like I could relate to, then sometimes my son, he stays with my husband when I had to go for conferences, et cetera. Now with the pandemic, it's all online, but I've often left him when he was two years old. The problems that he faced because I, it's not stereotyping, but my husband is not at all trained in housework. <laughs> you know, there is this very gender, gender division of labor that exists in India, despite educated. We are, we are, of course, the privileged class, but there is this gender division that exists. So many a times I could connect with the single fathers and the single mothers because of my own personal experiences. So that is where autoethnography really was helpful. That, that is what I Thank you. But uh, yeah, do you do you use also in your publication this kind of approach? So you explain overtly this kind of approach on your personal experience or not? Yes, I do. I do. When I when we publish, we explicitly mention about autoethnography. Uh, we also give we cite studies which have used autoethnography. Now it is commonly becoming a particularly on scholarship on motherhood. A lot of yeah. sociologists have now started using autoethnography. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so yes, when we publish, we do mention and we do write. Thank you. Thank you for your reply because I, I, I always, I'm always, uh, yes, um, about this topic is because it's a particular topic. I, I thinking, um, yeah, I always think about, uh, for example, the, the, the effects on the life of my children when I use old ethnography, because <laughs> we know that we live uh, in, a, in a world that is not uh, now, but <laughs> we have a future. And uh, so I, I always think about uh, the, the impact and the consequences that, uh, for example, uh, information that I put in uh, old ethnography can have uh, on my next generation also, on my children. So. It's just a, a personal, uh, it's not only a met methodological reflection, but I think it's also a personal reflection about uh, uh, the future, the impact on the future of uh, my children, but also the position that I have in that field, because uh, I think that is very important uh, um, uh, acknowledge that position, that I acknowledge that position, but it's also important that I question uh, uh, in particular that position, because uh, sometimes uh, I have some preconceptions uh, about single parenting, because I'm a single parent, uh, but I see that for other single parents, mothers, uh, uh, their experience is completely different from mine. So I think that we need to, to question our positions um, about our uh, personal experience. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do you have other questions for the other participants? Uh, I see um, that we have Luz uh, uh, Shivasri because uh, she has problems of connections, I think. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, um, and uh, um, if you have not other questions, I have the questions for, um, for Dries about uh, uh, institutions uh, because I see that uh, in the title of um, uh, your paper there is the mention about uh, institutions uh, so I was wondering about uh, um, so you know that I'm an institutional ethnographer so uh, the topic of I'm very sensitive about the topic of institutions and uh, I was wondering how we can on the, how uh, how you did it, yeah. How can we um, make that uh, the topic of institutions, the role of institution emerge, can emerge from our work uh, and in your work? 
That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that um, I liked the ring of institutionalism when I uh, edited the, uh, a stipe paper and it's like the preliminary thought of, uh, because a lot of what we see is about social norms, social expectations we have about parenting, about, in my case, also uh, work and, and being an employee. Um, and um, yeah, the question, how, how do you make this visible in, in qualitative data? It's, it's a really difficult, difficult thing, but we, we asked questions, we, we had this, this large data set because we work with students in the field. And we, are, we, 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 we asked questions to the interviewees like, what is a good parent uh, in your eyes? And, and also, do you consider yourself as a, as a good parent? Can you accomplish what you, what you think? And the same thing about, about being an employee. What does it mean? What, 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 what is in your country? Because some people tend to say like, yeah, just need to go and, and, and take care of, 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 of my job and, and do whatever they, they pay me for. And they're, they're stuck to my job. And other people have like this huge sense of responsibility for their organization. And they, they, they have to finish uh, certain assignments uh, because they don't, don't want to, to hand it over to colleagues and stuff. Um, while some parents are like, yeah, my, my uh, role as a parent is uh, being, uh, <clears throat> uh, as, as, as being there for my children and, and getting them from school and, and stuff, while other uh, want to be like, stress much more the involvement and, and the, the tutoring, the um, like, yeah, have a very strong um, um, demands from themselves, from, from what, what they want to, to be as parents. Uh, so, so that's one thing, like the aspirations and expectations you get yourself, like internalized, um, but, uh, a lot of uh, uh, some parts of the interviews also go uh, on like uh, what the interactions with, with other parts. Oh, what, what, what do colleagues say when you leave early from work because you want to take care of your children? Uh, what do your employers uh, say? Um, <clears throat> or um, sometimes you see within these aspirations as a parent that these aspirations are also socially created because. You, you people tend to say things like, I know it's expected from you, or what will the neighbors say when they see that there is a babysitter for a third time a week? Uh, and then you see, like, okay, it, it's kind of these, these expectations and aspirations are, are actually internalized also from what, what other people are expect. But it's very difficult to make this visible. So that's also, I think, why, <laughs> why we're a bit struggling in the point. I did Nina as a, as a co-author because she's much more sensible to, to see these things within the interviews and, and read through them uh, and find the, the right the organ to, to, to write them down. Uh, because there is, I'm, I'm very quite sure that there is a, a sense of institutionalism, there is social creation of the inequality and, and within these different expectations for men and for women, for mothers and for fathers. Um, now we can challenge ourselves, by the way. <laughs> I think this, this is a struggle, a struggle for, uh, from our generation to, um, to, to challenge the, the, the expectations society has for us that we have for each other as well. Um, but it is, yeah, we are struggling to, to uh, to let it emerge from the data, to, to find the right words, to, to write it down. But I think the paper will be coming and I'm looking forward <laughs> to, to finishing. That. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dries. Thank you because I, yeah, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a difficult topic because you know that, uh, and we know that uh, it's not easy because um, investigated, um, investigating, uh, and the role of institutions, uh, then we have different institutions, so we can generalize about institutions, no? But is, um, 
it's it's a it's a very it's challenging when you um, plan a research design. So it's challenging, and I think that uh, having uh, a, a, a theoretical framework uh, about this topic uh, helps a lot. Because um, I see, for example, because I come from grounded theory, but I see that uh, investigating uh, institutions, the role of institution in, in, um, in, with the life of parents, uh, institutional ethnography has helped me a lot. Because uh, this kind of uh, uh, approach that is not methodological, only methodological, but also theoretical approach, uh, uh, helps a lot in, in uh, I don't know, in tracing, in uh, um, keeping a track of uh, uh, the different parts, uh, the different evolutions, the perspective, the representations that, uh, um, and experience in particular that people and uh, minorities uh, have uh, with institutions. So I think that, that uh, uh, we can look beyond uh, uh, the methodological approach uh, and develop some reflection about the, the theoretical approach. Uh, yeah, I think that is very important because institutional ethnography generated in me a completely uh, change of perspective about uh, how to investigate uh, single parents problems. So <laughs> thank you, thank you for your reflections. So uh, if there are other comments on questions uh, for the other participants and from them, we have uh, still uh, about uh, 10 minutes for our discussions uh, because I think that from your research, uh, many, many interesting topics uh, and experts have merged. So uh, yeah, I think that we can use these 10 minutes to complete our reflections. So, yes, please. <laughs> uh, and maybe just some reflections more than questions, but um, I found it very interesting to uh, the way you um, spoke about auto ethnography as a single parent. And so in my case, I, um, I didn't set out to do anything specifically because I was a single parent, but it, it turned out as a coincidence that I was doing my research at a, a point where there was a social policy change. But I have to say, even as, um, you know, a, a, a single parent who I feel, you know, quite empowered, I have um, been employed and managed to study at the same time as probably not looking after my kids as well as I should. But I always felt, even in a, in a society like Australia, where um, the stigmatization of single parents has um, been on the decline. I always felt stigma myself personally about declaring myself as being a single parent and perhaps kind of, you know, having some sort of biased perspective on the experience of single parents. So I still feel like even from the perspective in, um, you know, advanced Western democracy like Australia, that there is a stigmatization that is quite internalized, um, you know, because it, it, it is still sort of considered to be some kind of fault of yours that you haven't been able to maintain, you know, the nuclear family. And um, it's very, you know, quite insidious, I suppose. So, um, yeah, so I just thought I'd, I'd reflect on that. So despite, you know, like all, all the liberalization that I've spoken about, you know, still someone like me still going, you know, I, I wasn't really that big on outing myself, you know, at the start. Um, and then I, ne I did necessarily as part of the reflection in the, in the process of the research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Because I think that there are um, hidden processes very hidden processes and perceptions about single parents that are very, I think, very, very old and are very hidden in ourselves and in people. So I think that we can pay attention of hidden processes and representations because they affect a lot, I see, because there is a difference from what the, um, the legal framework states. Um, because what the legal state, for example, uh, in European countries, you have a legal framework uh, that uh, emphasize about, uh, for example, uh, democracy, equality, gender equality, and so on. But I think that on the other side, there are not enough attention about this kind of hidden processes, because there are a lot of uh, beliefs uh, and uh, preconceptions about uh, single parents and they're very, very hidden. And uh, 
uh, I think that in our research, we should pay attention to these factors and these uh, very, very hidden aspects. So, so thank you. Uh, are there other, other contribution or reflection about this topic from the other participants? And maybe want to add that I just yeah, found it a very interesting session and I probably look at all your research papers or some of your research papers in the couple of the next couple of days because I think you all do very interesting research. Thank you. Thank you, Drius. Thank you for contributions. Yeah. yeah same here. I thought the, the there are amazing contributions. I heard some of the videos and I really uh, really liked all all the presentations, and I really look forward to the final papers. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a great picture conference. Thank you. I think that uh, just to um, I have some final words uh, uh, remarks before before the end of our uh, discussion, and I think that. Um, we will have uh, our opportunities uh, uh, to meet uh, again. <laughs> so we hope uh, that uh, next year and also uh, usually SSP uh, organizes many events. Uh, so we will have uh, our opportunities to meet again uh, and to uh, discuss about our research. And uh, um, I think that uh, if you like the idea, you can leave your name uh, on the um, uh, on the committee on the transnational initiatives committee guest book if you want to receive, for example, future announcement and participate in uh, uh, in these events. And also, you can leave a feedback on the link that I um, I included in the chat box. So I I'd like to um, thank you all for your participation. And uh, also, I would like to underline that uh, uh, Triple SP uh, as a transnational initiatives committee that is open to everyone uh, who like to be involved in. Um, organizing uh, events uh, in contributions and also in networking, because I think that uh, is networking is a very important part of our work as a researcher. So uh, please, if you like, you can join and contact us uh, um, when, when you prefer. So we are absolutely available for you and to discuss uh, uh, future events and opportunities opportunities of networking. So I would like to thank you again, all uh, thanks again, all speakers and participants for this very, very interesting discussion and for your presentation. And so uh, soon you will find the video recording of this live session on the session web page that is will be available um, soon that for, and so we can watch again our our discussion. So thank you again, and I hope that we will meet again in our in our meetings, okay, in our events. So thank you, thank you, thank you again, thank you. Thanks, Marina. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye everybody. Thank you.